I will praise your name forever, my King and my God. I will extol you, O my God and King, and I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day will I bless you, and I will praise your name forever and ever. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness. The Lord is good to all and compassionate toward all his works. I will praise your name forever, my King and my God. Please stand as we pray together this morning and ask God to be with us. Dear Gracious and Heavenly Father, we ask now that you would send your Holy Spirit into this space in a very special way. May we feel connected with you. May we increase our relationship with you right now. May we feel renewed and rested as we, as we think about your yoke and as you make our loads lighter and easier to bear this morning. Thank you for everything you do for us. Be with us now. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Let's remain standing and, uh, and sing together our opening hymn, hymn number 191, Love Divine.
Well, thank you, Linda. I think there's a lot of people praying right now. <laughs> uh, Elma, come on up and we welcome you as, as guests today and take a look at your bulletin. There's many good announcements there, but just a couple things I need to point out. Uh, because of the heat, uh, we're having our hospitality under the breezeway, so after the service uh, for the snacks, meet there, and for the prayer table as well, we'll be in the prayer room under the breezeway. Also, today is the last Sabbath for any of you who would like to have worthy student funds from Glendale Academy. We must have those applications in the office by Monday because Monday evening those decisions will be made for the year. Make sure you do all of that. Now we've got a big program coming up. BBS, Alma, tell us about it. Buenos dias. Buenos dias. I have an ambassador from Peru for you today. And we are going to take you on a journey to Peru on the week of the 17th through the 21st. Could you tell us a little bit about your country, just a little snippet? <laughs> okay, I was born in Peru, and I'm so happy to be here from Peru. And tell everybody, estoy muy feliz. I'm so happy. And I wanted to tell you that this custom is from Machu Picchu is from the mountains, very high mountains, more than 4,000 feet high. So we're, we're going to invite you to come to Machu Picchu for the BBS, and I brought something special from my country. This is a um, corn, but it's purple. And next Sabbath, we're gonna explain what are we gonna do with this purple corn. Thank you so very much. I want to share with you this morning, aren't you thirsty? It's a little bit hot today, isn't it? And uh, one of our mission emphasis from the, our VBS this year is to get water for the children in Peru. $5 takes, only takes $5 to provide water for one year for one child. We have a display up in the front, and you are welcome to join us and see how much water we can provide for the children in Peru. So let's bring the water to quench our thirst, but the water of life for the children in Peru. Thank you so much. Okay, boys and girls, it's time for you to come forward for the children's story. And while they're doing that, all the moms and dads and grandpas and grandmas, Please stand. Linda Cavanis, great to see you home. God bless you. We just voted you out last week. <laughs> Our former conference president's wife is here from Ohio. God bless you. Welcome. Please stand and greet one another. Anybody else want to say anything? 
pillows, pillows, a flashlight. Now, let me ask you, when you go to the beach, do you take along your skis? Only if they're water skis, huh? When you go to the mountains, do you take along your sand pail? No, you don't. Now, sometimes in life, we take things that we don't need. And I have some pretty heavy things here. Let's see what we don't need. What is this one? Worry. We take a long worry. What kind of things do you worry about? Do you worry about tests at school? Bad guys. Bad guys, yeah. Sometimes when you see things on the news, it makes you worry, doesn't it? Do you know what? I have worries too, we all do. But God has said, don't worry. So I think we can give this one to God. Shall we drop it and give it to him? Goodbye, worries. Okay, what else do we have? Anger. Yeah, this one is anger. Does anybody get angry here? What do you get angry about? When I have to clean my room. <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> but after you're done cleaning your room, it's really nice, isn't it? Sometimes you might get angry at your friend. Maybe they didn't pick you for their team. Maybe they didn't save a seat for you at lunchtime. But God doesn't want us to be angry at our friends or even angry at other people at all. So can we get rid of that one? Let's try to get rid of our, our anger. What's that one? Fear. Ooh. Elijah, what do you want to say about fear? Well, I'm afraid of the dark. Anybody else afraid of anything? Nightlights. You're afraid of nightlights. Hmm. What are you afraid of? Bad guys. Yeah, bad guys. There's lots of things maybe to be afraid of, but God doesn't want us to fear either. Wow. God says he'll take our fears too. This is a biggie. What's this one? Selfish. Being selfish. There's a reason why this is the biggest bag I brought. Because we have a lot of selfishness, don't we? We always want to be in first in line. We want to take the best piece of cake, the biggest piece of fruit. People are like that, you know. But God doesn't want us to be selfish either. That's another burden he doesn't want us to have. So let's give that one away too. Buy that selfish thing. Now God says in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, Come to me, all of you who are tired and carrying heavy loads, and I will give you rest. Become my servants and learn from me. I am gentle and free of pride. You will find rest for your souls. And get this, serving me is easy and my bags or my burden is light. So if you let Jesus take care of all those worries, fear and anger, selfishness, all of those things, then your burden will be light. You only have to serve Him. Let's bow our heads and say a little quick prayer. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for loving us. Thank you that we can bring you our burdens and say, Here, God, I can't carry this anymore. And please help us not to pick up those bags again. Amen. You may go back to your seats. There is no children's church today.
As the deacons make their way forward, let's turn our attention to the North American Division Women's Ministries, the recipient of our offering today. All across our division, from the United States to Canada, and from Bermuda to Guam and Micronesia, the women of the church are engaged in serving others. They give Bible studies, hold evangelistic meetings, and minister to those in shelters for battered and homeless women. They provide for the needs of families seeking refuge on our shores from the oppressive regimes, teach English as a second language, tutor school children, and make bags of love for children who are displaced from their homes or their parents. The women of the church make a significant difference in their communities and their congregations. Here at Vallejo Drive Church, we have a lady who leads this, Alma Wesley. Are you here, Alma? Would you please stand so we can acknowledge you? Thank you so much, Alma, for leading this effort in our church. I invite you to make a generous gift today to affirm their work and ministry. Please mark in your envelopes that your offering is for this um, ministry. The deacons will now collect the offering. you provide for us. Thank you for the opportunity to give. Thank you for blessing these offerings to be used in service to those who need it most in our world and our communities. And thank you for letting us be a part of your work. Amen.
Our scripture reading this morning is found on Matthew chapter 11, verses 25 to 30. I'll be reading from the New Revised Standard Version. At that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father and no except the Son and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me. All you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. May God add his blessing on our reading this morning. As we uh, sing hymn number 671, as we come to you in prayer, if there are those that have special requests or celebrations or want to come forward for special prayer, we'll do that at this point. Let us sing. If you're capable and would like to kneel, you can do that now as we talk to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, what a privilege it is to be able to come to you, the Almighty, the Creator, the only one in our lives that really mean anything and are there for us. Thank you, Lord, for being with us. You know, Lord, this morning I got up and I sat in the hot tub and I was watching the birds in my backyard. Those little hummingbirds are just so pretty and you made them. And then I noticed the sparrows. And then I thought, you know, you even know when a little sparrow falls. You know that you must care for us. If you watch the sparrows, I know you watch us and you care about us. Thank you, Lord, for being our shepherd. And we know when we allow you to be our shepherd, we do not have anything that we want. We just have everything. Lord, there are people here today who have <clears throat> problems 
They don't know what tomorrow holds. They don't feel very well. They're scared for the future. And yet Isaiah told us, do not fear, Lord, for I am with you. Oh, if we can just remember that and have our trust, increase our trust, enlarge our trust, give us more trust, Lord. Help us to trust you for everything. As we sit at the foot of the cross and we realize what you've given to us, that we can have trust in you, that you gave your life that we might have hope for the future. All this stuff on earth, Lord, this doesn't matter. As long as we don't fear and we trust. So we thank you this morning for the blessings that you gave us so abundantly each and every day. We thank you for our church and those all over the world who love you, who have hopes for the future. Lord, I think of Pastor Luke in a special way in this communion day. His words might fill our heart with joy. Draw us closer to you, Lord. Help us to realize in some big way that you're there for us and that we can trust you and that we have no reason to fear as long as you're our shepherd and you lead us. So we thank you now for the privilege of being able to talk to you. We ask that you continue to bless as you have, for Jesus' sake. Amen. What does it mean to say that you know God? What does it mean to say that you know God? Does it mean doing your daily devotionals? Attending your weekly Bible study? Does it mean reading books about theology and religion? Knowing about Hebrew and Greek? Maybe it means coming to church once a week? In our passage today, we see Jesus and actually, I invite you to have your Bibles open on today's passage, if you'd like, because I'll be referring to it quite a lot. So have, have the passage open, and um, it'll help you follow along. And In this passage, we see Jesus praying to his Father in this intensely intimate way. And so he says, No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son. So you can see that Jesus and his Father enjoy this very unique relationship. And so, over the centuries, the church worked very hard to understand what it meant exactly to say that Jesus was the Son of the Father. Did it mean he was God's Son in the same way that King David was? Or may maybe Jesus was more like an angel? Or maybe Jesus was just another great prophet, or priest, or teacher. One popular view in the first and second centuries was modalism. And modalism said that actually Jesus was the Father who had 
kind of morphed into a human being and who came to earth in a different mode of being. Another view originating from a priest named Arius stated Jesus was a created being. And there was a point in time where Jesus didn't actually exist. And so Arius said only the Father was really worthy of being called God. But over time it was decided that those views were egregiously inaccurate. And so people who believed in those uh, views were actually expelled from the church as heretics. No, no, no. Jesus clearly saw himself relating to the Father in this much, much deeper way. And so eventually the church came up with the right, the correct terminology, which is something that we all ought to believe. And they said, Jesus has existed from all eternity as God's only begotten Son. The Father doesn't create Jesus, rather they have always existed together in this Father-Son relationship. The Son and the Father share the same essence, they share the same nature, and they always, always have. So when we talk about Jesus knowing the Father, we're, we're articulating the fact that they share in this intimate bond of love from all eternity. It means so much more now when we say the Son is in the Father, and the Father is in the Son. Okay, I know I opened with a lot of heavy theology, and I was thinking twice about doing that, but I thought I'd do it anyway. So maybe you're thinking, what on earth am I going on about? Why does this concern any of us? Well, that's exactly my point. Everything I just said really does concern us, because Jesus goes on to say, as you read, that the deeply intimate connection to the Father that he has is something that's available to you and to me. Knowing God in this intimate way is the goal for all of us. And this knowing God goes far beyond some formal intellectual knowledge. If any of you out here are married, you'll know what I'm talking about, right? I know about my wife. I know that she has blonde hair. I know that she's scared of spiders. I know that she likes pancakes on a Sunday morning. But I also know my wife. I know what she's thinking even when we're miles apart. I can predict her moods fairly accurately often. And over time, even her desires in life become my desires. But here's the point. Even that level of intimacy that is achieved between a husband and a wife is just a fraction of the union we ought to have with God. We are called not to know about God, but to know God in that same relational way that Jesus does. God's own life becomes available to us. Good news, right? Right? Yes, thank you, right. Well, good news indeed, but not for everyone, Jesus says. Because Jesus says he chooses to reveal the Father to certain people. You know, the, the reality is some people will attain this intimacy with God, some people won't. Does this seem fair? Does Jesus just arbitrarily pick some people to reveal God to? And does he just arbitrarily pick some people to hide God from? Of course not. No. This is the point. Divine revelation comes to those who are open to it. Many of us are not. And so Jesus goes on to explain, all of us will choose one of two camps. The so-called wise and intelligent, who in their arrogance totally miss God's revelation, and then the little humble ones, 
the humble of heart who gladly receive God. And so the wise and the intelligent are those that think they know better than God. People who rely on their own insight and their own individual authority in order to find truth and meaning in their life. I know that I'm like that sometimes. But the little ones, by contrast, are not stupid, they're not unintelligent, but they know better than to rely on their own resources. They are open to letting God be a priority in their lives. They are the ones who are humble enough to cry out with Jesus like little children to a personal and loving father saying, Abba, which means daddy. Abba, I want your will for my life to take precedent over my own distorted and limited will. So presumably, we all want to have this intimate relationship with God, right? But how, how is this actually going to benefit us, you might be wondering? What does this do for you and for me? Well, this might sound pretty uh, over the top, but I believe it. We find the solution to all of our life's problems by being connected to Jesus. And Jesus, as you read here, he throws out this invitation to who? All. Jesus says, come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Now, is Jesus saying something new? No, because God has always been a God of rest. In the very beginning of the Bible, in Genesis, when God rests after six days of hard, creative, artistic work, what does he do? He takes a day off. God shows that he is not a workaholic and he doesn't want us to be either. So he commands this Sabbath rest for us, a respite for our souls built into the weekly rhythm of our lives. And then the story of Exodus, all about finding rest from oppressive burdens. You remember the Pharaoh? For the Pharaoh, there is no such thing as rest from work. So he refuses to let God's people go into the desert just for three days so that they can worship. No weekends, no coffee breaks, no resting. And so what happens in Exodus? The Israelites cry out for rest. And God hears them. He sees the injustices and he sees the burdens being placed upon his people and so he delivers them. He delivers them into a lush and beautiful promised land where they will have rest from their enemies. Our God was, is and always will be a God of rest. And so in our passage, Jesus, being God, takes up this same theme of rest. And what is the rest that Jesus promises to his contemporaries? Well, for one thing, he's talking about the obsessive and unreasonable demands of the scribes and Pharisees, the demands that they place on people, excessively concerning themselves with regulating everyone's behavior. How burdensome to be told that you can't help your cow out of a ditch on the Sabbath day. How burdensome to be told that you have to wash your hands before every single snack. How burdensome to be told that you must wear certain clothes when you come to church. Or that you have to give a certain amount of money. Or that you have to believe all the right doctrines about everything. And I think Jesus is also talking about the burdens, the daily burdens that we all carry. 
the pressures of life that we all face, the stress, the anxiety, the depression, the loneliness. We're all restless, aren't we? You may as well admit it. We all get so restless. And so, as we think about the final words of this passage, isn't the last thing we want another yoke to put around our necks? I have a slide to show you, if you guys would put it up. If you're like me, you probably used to think of a yoke in maybe this way. When I read the passage, I thought of a yoke in this very negative way, something that wears you down. I thought that Jesus was talking about this cattle yoke, a wooden beam attached to a pair of cows, forcing them to work together to carry a load. But that yoke to me looks so awkward, so painful. If you show the next slide, you'll see that the yoke Jesus is referring to is a human yoke worn by a person to simply distribute the weight across the shoulders. A yoke actually makes it easier to carry your burdens. So when Jesus talks about taking up his yoke, it is not something cumbersome or exhausting, but something that makes carrying your load far easier. Note that Jesus never promises, never promises that following him means that you're going to be free from burdens. In fact, Jesus assures us that we will have difficult things to deal with in our lives. But under his yoke, we can handle whatever it is that life throws at us. Because now we have this intimate union with God. So maybe you're sitting here today and you believe that this rest is something that God has for you, but maybe you think it's something that you're going to have to wait so long for, something that will arrive one day in heaven in the far off future, and in the meantime, you just have to suck it up. But if that's what you think, you're wrong. Now, while those eschatological dimensions of eternal rest are true, Jesus tells us if we put on his yoke now, we can all experience rest today. When we make God the absolute priority in life, when we keep God at the forefront of our imagination, our heaviness is lifted immediately and our souls feel lighter and at peace. So my simple challenge for us all today is this. And guys, you know what your burdens are. Anxiety, maybe. Insecurity. Stress. Addiction. Guilt. Shame. Loneliness. Fear. And maybe, maybe you're scrambling around, trying to find the rest you need from these burdens, but you keep attaching yourself to the wrong things. Your ego, money, pleasure, maybe a workout routine, maybe your career, maybe another relationship. I urge you all, break free from the false yokes that are weighing you down. We can all feel so restless at times. It's so easy just to watch our whole lives fly by as we hopelessly, hopelessly put our rest in the wrong things. But ultimately, all of those finite things will fail and they will never satisfy you. Why? Simply because they are not God. Jesus says, come to me, all of you, Attach yourself instead to my easy yoke. Have your burdens, but keep them in their proper place. Instead, feel full and feel rested, even when times are tough, knowing that with me and in me and through me, you too can share in the divine life. Amen.
that our sins have done to our lives, that you will restore us to life as you've created us to be. So we thank you for this gift of love. And as we partake of these emblems, we claim the promise you've given us of this forgiveness and healing and eternal life. We thank you for it and ask these things in Jesus' name.
as we partake of this ceremony of celebration, we are renewing a covenant. A covenant with Jesus to come into our hearts and minds to fill us with his life. It is not a covenant based on our promises or our performance, but it is a covenant of love where Jesus gives us the life that we can never have on our own. Just as we take this bread or this fruit of the vine into us, it is assimilated in our bodies by natural process. We don't even have to work at it. So in our spiritual lives, when we invite Jesus in, He changes us into His image. We have the life of Christ in us as a gift. So, as Jesus said, Take eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. The same man who took the cup, a new covenant in his blood. The scripture tells us after the Last Supper, they sang a hymn and went out. Let us join together in singing hymn number 334. Come now, found of every blessing. and rested. May we willingly attach ourselves to Jesus Christ and his yoke, finding our burdens lighter and easier.
as we intimately unite our lives to our Father. Amen.